I want to make things honest too, and um, and develop that um, aspect of my of my soul, my nature, and and I'm very very much into writing about my philosophy about anything and everything that comes to mind. Most of my writing life is concerned with how the past collides with the present. But I'm also seeing, you know, that there's a lot of things, even in, in my personal life, that um, they were like seeds that somebody put there. I've learned so much about Hawaii and about these people and about the culture. Things like that are, are, are special, uh, I think, for everybody and not, not just for me. Memoir writer Johnny Frisbee, playwright Victoria Newbel, and television director Phil Arnone are all storytellers. They strive to capture and share the human experience, whether it's about their own lives or the lives and times of those who came before. Storytellers, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha my kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Former Hawaii Public Radio General Manager Michael Titterton likes to call storytelling the quintessential social act, one of the oldest human behaviors that's not only a vehicle for healing, illumination, and understanding, but for being civilized. In this edition of Long Story Short, we revisit three storytellers who were previous guests on this program and hear what drives them to tell stories. Johnny Frisbee and Victoria Newbel are writers. Phil Arnone tells stories through the visuals and the sounds of television. We begin with Florence Frisbee, known all of her life as Johnny. Her American father, who also was a writer, left the United States in the 1920s looking for a simpler life. He found his paradise on the small atoll of Puka Puka in the Cook Islands. Johnny Frisbee was the second of five children born to Robert Frisbee and a native Puka Pukan. Johnny was only a teenager when she published her autobiography, Miss Ulysses from Puka Puka. And in her book, she recounts the story of her young life being raised primarily on the small atoll, but moving from island to island in the South Pacific. We were very busy kids, you know, the kids are busy. We played a lot, climbed trees and hide and seek and swim in the lagoon, swim out to the corals, our way out. And then, um, but we had duties too, you know, we had to help the women in the taro patch. Yeah. Well, that's hard yeah. work. Yeah, well, we didn't play it most of the time, <laughs> but we did. and that was that was introducing us to work and and uh, teaching us mainly basically how to take care of taro patch, and um, there wasn't much uh, to do for kids, but we didn't miss anything. We were also comfortable doing nothing, just sitting. You know, just sitting and looking at each other, or maybe sing a song, or um, and uh, and you know, and ask a few questions or two. It was really basically a lot of thinking. You know, Pukapukan people think a lot. They just sit and they and they you know they look up and they look up at the coconut tree, maybe thinking, hmm, that's almost ripe. Oh, I must pick that one. Yeah, there's a lot of pen, um, uh, uh, communicating to the outer. So that's why you were able. You, you wrote this book between the ages of 12 and 14. I kept it, started the diary at 12. Yeah, and. Um, no, I finished the book at 15. Yeah, came out when I, just before my, uh, just around 16, when I was 16, just before my pa father died. So it was a diary. It, it yeah. In which language did you keep oh, your diary? Of, oh, I kept it in uh, Pukapukan mainly, and then uh, English. Um, as I went along, I write in Pukapukan, and I would ask my father what that word is in English, and he would explain it to me, and then I would use the word. But I was. Uh, beginning to, by the time I was 
14, I was able to write in English. Might be not the best, mm -hmm. you know, but I was able to use adjectives because my father said you can't just write like that. You have to, you have to put a colorful word there to, you know, to make the next word uh, happy. <laughs> 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 and Miss Ulysses, where did Miss Ulysses come from? Well, because <clears throat> there were no children's books in the, that part of the world um, at, growing up, my father used, at night time, used rather than, than read, and there's no children's stories, he would, would tell us the, um, the story of Ulysses in the Iliad and the um, Odyssey of Homer. You know, every night he would go through um, the whole uh, a series of um, adventures of Ulysses, and that's where that was all I knew, you know. And so when the book was finished, and my father said, "Well, uh, we've got to find a name for this book," mm -hmm. we thought about it, thought about it for days and days, and then I, and then I said, "Oh, you know, how about Miss Ulysses?" Because I'm Ulysses, I'm not like Daddy or Papa, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you identified with Ulysses, and, and it was an adventure well, we kind did. of life. You, I mean, you yeah, were well, facing we, elements. We, yeah, we, yeah, that's right. And, and we traveled a lot, you know, we did, even if it's just from one island to the other. And to us, it was big time. You've been, um, you've received accolades as the first woman <laughs> writer out of the Pacific <laughs> at age. 15 mm -hmm. is when the book came out. Mm -hmm. what, how does that make you feel? I, uh, good. Uh, I feel good. But the thing is, because I think being so young has given a challenge to the women who are hit educated. You know, I mean, like the New Zealand women, Maori women who, you know, have degrees at university. You know, it made it easy for them, it made it easy for a lot of Polynesian women to say, hey, she did it at 14 and she had a book published at 16. You're kind of mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, why can't I do it? You know, it was, to me, that was, that makes me happy, you know, if I was of some use in that, in that, in that area. Mm -hmm. You continue to write, and I think when you write, it, it, it focuses, it makes you think maybe better? I mean, I, I, just because you, you're involved in the exercise of putting things mm -hmm. down that have to be mm -hmm. true and authentic, mm -hmm. um, what, have, what insights have you come to over your yeah. life as you uh, look back? Yeah. I've, I've been very lucky. Yeah, I've been very lucky. Uh, um, uh, I don't know how to, how to say, because um, I've delved a lot in philosophy, and um, and um, and so I want to make things honest too, and um, and develop that um, aspect of my of my soul, my nature. And, and I'm very, very much into writing about my philosophy about anything and everything that comes to mind. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's also, and I'm discovering that I haven't really um, committed f f fully to what the majority of people think about some things and how they do it. And uh, and I and I'm very careful that I don't I don't uh, make a fool of the the life the people I'm with my family. Is that's that because of, of your up, uh, your upbringing and how? It's so different. Yeah, it's so different. It's it, it's it's been a it's not a struggle, but it's been a constant awareness of. Um, my, you know, where I come from, you know, my feelings, my th thinking. Victoria Nalani Newbel has spent a lifetime as a playwright and as an author of mystery books for which she has received literary awards from the Hawaii State Foundation on Culture and the Arts and the Hawaii Literary Arts Council. Victoria's Polynesian heritage is at the heart of her passion for writing stories, whether they are about historical figures from Hawaii's past, fictional sleuths, or events that change the course of history in our islands. Most of my 
writing life is concerned with how the past collides with uh, present but I'm also saying you know that there's a lot of things even in in my personal life that um, they were like seeds that somebody put there you know and from the past and that you know someone planted a seed when I was a little girl and you know something else grew <laughs> when I grew up and so I think that um, you know the past and the present and the future can get extremely blurry and I think we have a lot to you know especially when we look back at how our kupuna took care of their physical environment boy we we have a lot to learn from them I think your plays give a sense of that that the past is always it's a constant it's always part it's a sort of timeless I think there's certain things that transcend time and I think that some of us you know we feel that you know the responsibility of our kupuna are, is our responsibility too you know and I when I look at what my great grandmother was doing during the 19th century how she was close to the queen and how she supported the monarchy in a really tough time I kind of feel like you know that's you know I should be doing that some of that kind of work too so I what does that mean today to be doing the kind of work of supporting the monarchy which no longer there. exists well for me um, you know my work um, in writing living history programs and presenting public programs about that time period in history that has been my work you know that I've wanted to do and that I've had the opportunity to do so um, I feel like telling that story over and over and over again and what to accomplish what well I think that well for one thing you know that history was not um, told to me when I was in school and I think that when we understand what happened in the past to our country and our people that we will be able to make better decisions about what we create in the future because I feel like if you don't understand your your personal past your collective past you can get into a lot of trouble at some point did you leave playwriting behind or just you did you decide to take a break and write novels mystery novels <laughs> well I, I could never leave playwriting behind because that's where I started writing but at some point I realized gosh my plays are pretty serious you know and I, I really need to have some fun with my writing so I think I'll write a mystery because when I you know when I want to um, relax and when I want to um, be when I my escape literature is you know old-fashioned cozy mysteries and so I decided to um, try and write a mystery you put many places that you know places that you know well into the their their settings you you actually have the curator of Bishop Museum killed in the muse <laughs> museum <laughs> well I um, you know because I worked in the museum field for so long I I knew that um, I knew that field pretty well so I made use of it you know and I um, I I really feel that novel writing you know even when it's um, fiction that's kind of a genre fiction mysteries those kinds of stories preserve history in their own way you know they tell us a little bit about the past in a really you, different you way put the Holly Evil Hotel in your your yeah. novel yeah which really existed yeah yes and, and just the way people related to each other you know I mean I feel so fortunate to have known um, you know the kind of kupuna that aren't with us anymore so I think fiction is a wonderful place for preservation one of the uh, things that I really want people to know who would like to be writers and who would like to write and who are from the islands or the Pacific is that our stories are so worth telling and that we have such a rich history 
and a rich present um, that we have more than enough material to to um, supply the world with wonderful stories and that you know it doesn't matter if you don't make the bestseller list in New York if you write something that is heartfelt and genuine you are are leaving a gift for your community and so I encourage people to you know look at where they came from and tell those stories. Phil Arnone made his mark in Hawaii as a television director and producer. He not only directed the top-rated Channel 9 News during the 1970s and 80s, but he produced and directed live coverage of many local events and other regular programs. He returned to his roots in the San Francisco area to continue his career in television production. When he decided it was time to retire in 2002, he and his wife moved back to Hawaii. But as it turns out, he did not retire. Instead, he put his knowledge of the Hawaii community and his production skills to work in creating television specials about Hawaii's iconic people and places. His documentaries about such people as Duke Kahanamoku, Rap Replinger, Eddie Aikau, Don Ho, Israel Kamaka Viva Ole, Dave Shoji, and Jimmy Borges are only a few of the programs he has produced. What makes Phil Arnone's program so special is his persistence to dig deep. He presses for more, more, more in telling the story of a person's life, whether it's finding people who know the subject of the story or rummaging in garages for old film footage and photographs stashed in boxes that had long been forgotten. A long time ago in South Africa, his family. God bless you guys. I miss all of you so much. Aloha. Do you go under people's beds to find this video? I mean, and film. You are you find stuff that nobody else has found to illustrate your films. Well, you just have to not give up. You know, because it's not all immediately available. I mean, lots of times people have it in cardboard boxes in the back of the house somewhere in the garage, and you got to encourage them and make them want to. You know, because we're usually talking about a friend or a family member in this case, and I said, I need your help. You know, um, we need to see, like when we did the Rap Replinger show, um, I mean, part of it was old footage from the action stuff, the fun stuff he did. But we found uh, footage of him as like a three-year-old on eight millimeter in a cardboard box in the back of the house. And, but his sister, one of his sisters found that for me. And uh, it, it was great. I mean, it was, it's so much f more fun to see somebody grow old into where you remember them and tell the story that way. <laughs> It harks, harkens back to those days where nothing less than perfection was okay for your newscast. Because I, I've seen you, you have enough material to do a, a very good film, but you will go get more and more information and you're, you're okay with a lot of it not being used just so you have all the great choices. Yes, that's important. I mean, we do, we need to have all of that. Obviously, we can't use every photograph or every piece of footage, but... But you'll go out of your way to get that photograph even, and yeah. you, you don't feel bad if you don't use it later. No, I don't. But I I want to have it. I want I want Robert, when he writes, to feel like, 
we'll have something to show. It's not going to be a radio show we're doing suddenly. We need to have visuals, and uh, I need to make sure that I give him enough to, to write to. So, yeah, I mean, I think most producers will try and do that. Who are some of the celebrities you've done, you know, you've gotten to know uh, well through following their lives and coming up with the 60 Minutes oh, show? Um, well, I, I, you're, you're right. Some of them, uh, for, for a while, we were doing only shows about people that had passed on. And uh, <laughs> then if I call somebody and they think, uh, say I want to do a show, they get very nervous. <laughs> they think I've been talking to their doctor or something and know something they don't. But uh, you know, we started with, um, I think, Eddie Aikau and Duke Kahanamoku and Iz. Those were the first three that we did. And obviously, those, those gentlemen have passed on. But um, the, the truth is that I've learned so much about Hawaii and about these people and about the culture. Uh, that I never learned when I was here working at KGMB. I mean, I, we never did shows like this, and I never left that station. I was always in the station doing things. And this, uh, the, the treat is that I, it's as much fun for me as I hope it is for the viewers, because I'm looking at these great old photos with this fun footage and learning about what the, what the, you did that? I, mean, I had no, like the, uh, the Jimmy Borges show, um, I was totally unaware of his Forbidden City activities in San Francisco as a, as a young singer. And uh, I thought he just was born at Trappers. <laughs> but uh, things like that are, are, are special, uh, I think, for everybody and not, not just for me. And there isn't much in the way of long-form filmmaking uh, for, for commercial use. No, and uh, I think uh, you know, Mr. Blaine Giardi has been kind enough to continually support this kind of programming. And uh, without that, you know, it wouldn't be done because they become expensive and, and um, you've got to give him something he can sell. There must have been moments in making your shows where you thought, I got it, that's the moment, that's the shot. The uh, Jimmy Borges documentary, the the best shot that, that people will remember and maybe cry at and laugh at and enjoy and applaud at will be uh, when he stood up and sang a, a duet with uh, Melvin Leed at the Moana a celebration of, uh, love of Love of Jimmy evening. And uh, it's an incredible experience just to be there and we have it on video and uh, it's a very emotional time. Follow me. When you left. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. In San Francisco. In San Francisco. Where I met you. I remember the day. At the Miyako. She had a mink coat to her ankles <laughs> in the middle of July. <laughs> she thought she looked so hot. <laughs> I was. I dearly love what I'm doing now. Um, I could, and that's why I keep doing it, I guess. I mean, I've never, never get tired of it. Uh, and it, uh, it keeps me, I think, from being boring and bored. And uh, hopefully it's, uh, these stories are worthwhile doing, so I'll continue to do them. Thanks to the drive and determination of those whose passion it is to tell stories, Hawaii history and culture are kept alive and our community is richer for it. Mahalo to Florence Johnny Frisby, Victoria Nalani Newbel, and Phil Arnone, all of Honolulu, for telling your stories and for sharing your experiences with us. And mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha ahuiho. 
for audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. Thank you.